Okay. Uh, this is our last session for the winter quarter, but I do want to let you know that we will be back starting April 6th at 1130 on Thursdays. So we will have a new series starting on April 6th and our theme will be cultural connections. And we're gonna be bringing back a couple of the speakers that weren't able to participate this quarter due to weather and illness. So uh, Chris Tower will give his talk and Alexis Corey will give her talk. So we'll have a little bit of, uh, of the wrap up from this quarter on to next quarter as well. I also have a questionnaire in the back. So if you want to fill out one of those, that's helpful for me to help planning for future to see how we find out about these events, what draws people here and what kind of things you want to see in the future. So please feel free to fill that out and you can bring it down to the front table here. I've got a stack of them. They're anonymous. Just want to know what people think. Um, and again, I want to thank Humanities Washington for their generous grant, which allowed us to give this series this year. So with all that out of the way, all the business out of the way, I get to welcome a new speaker. I'm very excited to bring someone new into the community conversations fold. Uh, Alan Rose is the author of three published novels and one novella. His novel about the AIDS epidemic, As If Death Summoned, won the 2021 Forward Indies Small Independent Publishers Book of the Year Award for the LGBT category. Alan is the book reviewer for the Columbia River Reader and hosts Book Chat on KLTV. He also coordinates WordFest, a monthly gathering of writers and readers in Cowlitz County. And most recently, he is working with the Longview and Kelso Public Libraries to launch Book Club for Our Times, which discusses books that are shaping our world. Please welcome Alan Rose. Thank you, Courtney. Can you hear me okay? Just too loud. Okay, good. Well, thank you so much for coming out today. I really appreciate it. It's nice to have so many friendly faces here. Um, that helps take care of the anxiety. Um, it reminds me that I'm talking to friends about books um, rather than uh, that I am presenting a lecture at Lower Columbia College, which can feel really daunting, you know, still it looks good on the resume. <clears throat> We're going to be talking about <clears throat> the power of books. <clears throat> how books transform the world, but also how books transform our lives. And I really appreciated Courtney's invitation because it gave me the opportunity to reflect upon the role of that books have played in my life. And I would invite you during this time to reflect upon the role books have played in your lives as well. And near the end, but during the last 10 minutes, I'll be asking you what books have really impacted you, what books have influenced or changed your view of the world. Um, and we'll have an opportunity to, to hear uh, from, from some books that, that have been important to all of you. Um, I really have nothing terribly new or profound to share with you. This has just really been an opportunity for me to think about uh, the, the importance of books. And um, I can get carried away at times um, when I get passionate. So I'm asking Courtney to be my timekeeper over here. And um, if I'm not wrapping up, you know, say around by two o'clock, you just, you just cut it, okay? <clears throat> Okay. Courtney, I'm not getting anything on this. It's not moving. So is there any case there? Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Two ideas I'm presenting. First is that books transform the world by transforming individual lives. And the second proposition I'm propositioning you is on our life journeys, books can serve as mileposts 
indicating the people we once were, the people we are now, and the people we may yet become. Let me give you an example. When I was 13, first year in junior high school or middle school, um, Mrs. Ellen Taranjo was the librarian at McLaughlin Junior High School in Vancouver, Washington. And we were made for each other, she and myself. Um, she loved me because I was a kid who just really was always looking for books to read. And she was a librarian who was always trying to get kids to read books. And uh, I mean, really, she gave me so many books during that, that year, uh, put me on so many books. Uh, if she would have recommended the U.S. tax code, I would have read it, you know. But one book that she read, that she um, proposed was Lord of the Flies. And I love this book. You probably have read it too, sometime in school. It's about a bunch of English schoolboys who are on a plane and the plane crashes on a tropical isle. All of the adults are killed. Um, and this island is sort of paradise. It has everything. It has shelter, food, uh, everything that they need. It is a paradise. And yet it becomes a hell as the boys turn from being civilized English schoolboys into savages. I love this. This was like Jules Verne, uh, Robert Louis Stevenson. I mean, I was totally there with this book. Well, several years later, uh, as a junior in high school, the book was assigned. And I thought, oh, that's great. I've already read it. But I read it again. And I could not believe that it was the same book. The book hadn't changed, but I had. What was, at 13, an exciting boy's own adventure tale, at 17 became a rather profound analysis on the human condition. And this is the first time I realized how important books are in that they can tell us about changes within ourselves. Ralph the, the lead kid, you know, was sort of symbolizing civilization and the civilizing effect. With him was Piggy or Edward, you know, who symbolized reason and intellect and how they go together. Um, but then they had Jack, who was heading head of the choir boys, and they became the sort of the brute, aggressive side of humanity. And what Golding was doing was showing us in this book how through fears of the beast that was on the island that never, no one ever really ever saw, that through the beast, their fears turned them into barbarians. And then, of course, my favorite, there was Simon, the little mystic who understands the meaning of the Lord of the Flies. It was fantastic. One of those books that just really was a milepost for me. Edmund Wilson, a literary critic, once said that no two persons ever read the same book. And no, he wasn't talking about my books necessarily. All books, we bring our life experiences to them. And that's why, you know, someone can say, oh, you got to read this book. It's fantastic. I love this book. It's the best book I've ever read. And you read it and you think, really? Yeah. You know, you just don't see what was there. Well, it was two different life experiences uh, that were coming to it. And so the books that we'll be looking at tonight, uh, today, are basically the books that have very much impacted me. And then, like I said, we'll hear from, from you as well. But do books really transform the world? That's the question, I guess. How did this book transform the world? What did it do? Abolition, causing the Civil War, Uncle Tom's Cabin was a huge bombshell in the 1850s, and it brought the horrors and the inhumanity of slavery to people who, for whom that was basically an abstract concept, particularly in the North. Um, when Lincoln met Harriet Beecher Stowe in 1862, he was to said to her, so this is the little lady who created this great war. 
now down. This is an easy one, Darwin. Goodbye, Adam. Goodbye, Eve. Goodbye, Eden. Suddenly we're learning that humankind had evolved over millions of years. The church was not amused. This book, The Jungle, I don't know if you know it about it. This was a also a major work written by a muckraker, um, Upton Sinclair, uh, Sinclair, novelist and journalist. And he wrote a novel, The Jungle, about the Chicago meatpacking industry. It was so horrific in terms of both it, the worker exploitation, but also the unhygienic nature of it. There was an uproar which caused Congress to create um, the Pure Food and Drug Act, which by the 1930s became the um, Food and Drug Administration. Basically because of this book, it brought people aware of what was happening and there was a response. You may know this book, Silent Spring. Probably many of us read it when we were in middle school about the unrestricted use of DDT and the profound impact it was having on the environment. Rachel Carson's book is often considered to be to have launched the modern environmental movement. Because of this, not only was DT, DDT restricted in its use, as along with much others, but the Environmental Protection Agency was formed during the Nixon administration in the 70s. This is probably a bestseller you haven't read, <clears throat> neither have I. 1543, Copernicus. He, studying the heavens, says, you know, I don't think the Earth is the center of the universe after all. I don't think... The sun is revolving around the earth with the other planets. I think earth is revolving around the sun. Now, Copernicus was no dummy. He knew this about 20, for 20 years before he ever published it because he knew that it was not going to go over well. You know? Since ancient times, the earth was the center of the universe. Kepler, Jonas Kepler in 1603, I think, you know, he, he even refined it. And so we developed the, what's called the heliocentric uh, theory of the universe. Uh, the sun was the center of the universe. They were both wrong. Galileo in 1663 brought out a further book. Okay, at this point, the church caught on. The Inquisition came and visited Galileo and uh, invited him to reconsider his position. And because, like Copernicus, Galileo was no dummy, he said, yeah, you know, you're right. I, I guess I, 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 I miscalculated that. His books were, were banned until 1835, almost 300 years after Copernicus. You know, these books of Copernicus, Kepler, and Galileo, nonetheless, they became the beginning of modern science as we know it. You know, using verifiable information. It did not happen immediately, but it was through their efforts and through their bravery that it did happen. We probably read Oliver Twist and David Copperfield, you know, but did you know that it was because of the horrific conditions that were uh, uh, told in, in Dickens' stories that child labor laws were brought in to England, as well as some other horrific abuses of the early industrial um, uh, revolution. Across the channel, Les Miserables was written by Victor Hugo, and Hugo and Dickens were both, both doing something very powerful in their novels. They were putting a human face onto the poor. Before that, the poor, were considered a criminal class. You, know, you could, you could, you could, you could verify it. You know, if your father, or if your grandfather was a criminal and put into prison or debtor's prison, your father was probably a criminal and put into debtor's prison, and that was probably going to be your future too. It was a class. It was a criminal class, and that's why England could take these criminals and send them off and dump them into Australia. You know, as a penal colony. With Dickens and Hugo, they presented the poor as human beings. 
and we understood their stories of Valjean, Jean Valjean stealing bread just to feed his nephews and being uh, serving 20 years for it, or Cassette um, having to turn to prostitution to um, care for her child. These became living beings and people identified with them, felt for them. And because of that, changes began happening. The American Revolution was in 1776. The French Revolution was 1789. But it was Thomas Paine's pamphlet, The Rights of Man, in 1791 that gave the revolution sort of an ideological basis, a foundation, you know, that people at that time, they said all men were created equal, that all men, women hadn't been inv invented by that time yet, that all men should be treated equally under the law. And this was profound to us. We take these for granted. But in that time, it was revolutionary. You're saying that a peasant is as equal as an aristocrat, that a serf is as equal as the czar, saying, yes, created equally in God's image. Eventually, these ideas would lead to the social revolutions of the 1800s and be um, formalized in the UN Charter of Universal Rights in 1948, I think it was. Well, a year later, they, in, they invented women. And Mary Wollstonecraft wrote her vindication of the rights of women. Now, this is really fun to watch the progression of an idea. This was not a new idea, but Mary Wollstonecraft framed it, put it together so it could be read, disseminated, considered, and so by less than, well, 50, about 50 some years later, in 1848 was the Seneca Falls Convention in New York with Elizabeth Cady Stanton, getting together a group of people and saying women should have the right, same right as men. Again, this was not a new idea. Abigail Adams, during the time of the revolution, was telling John Adams, when he went off to uh, the Constitutional Convention, Remember the ladies, John. Now, the plan among some of the Northern de delegates was to have women recognized uh, as equal rights too. Well, John, you know, he forgot. And so women's rights were curtailed. But follow the dates, 1792, Mary Wollstonecraft puts forth this, this book. 1848, the Seneca Falls Convention takes place. Less than 100 years later, which seems like a lot, but less than 100 years later, 1920, women get the vote in the United States. Now, are they done with that? No, no. Another big bombshell came out in 1949, Simone de Beauvoir's the Second Sex. This was a major book, a profound book. Now, what had happened during that time was that the Second World War came on, men went off to fight against fascism, and women went into the factories. Women uh, uh, managed the farms. You know, women were coming out of the female closet, in effect. You know. And with the end of the war, the men returning, a lot of women lost their jobs and they were sort of shunted back into the earlier role as housewives, uh, as mothers, which is important roles. But a number of women wanted more. And Simone de Beauvoir sort of gave expression to this. Her famous statement is that people, uh, one is born a female, but is made a woman that a woman is a cultural concept. Now, I always like to point this out. This is sort of, you know, feminine and feminism at its best, but men have benefited so much by this because as women realized that to be a woman was to be culturally defined, 
men of, of more recent years, I mean, we're slow, uh, caught on that, you know, the same thing about men too. You know, men are culturally defined in ways that limit us. Um, and we're just now dealing with issues like toxic max masculinity. That's really making this clear. Well, the second sex was important because once again, it gave women and men an understanding of, of our roles in society. Less than 20 years after that, another big book came out, Betty Friedman's The Feminine Mystique. And this, she was really addressing this to the women, your mothers, or maybe grandmothers, who were at home and they knew they had the intellect, they had the imagination, they had the interest to be more than the housewife. You know, the feminine mistake really became its own sort of manifesto about this. You know? And her famous question is, is this all there is? Is this all there is? Okay, talk about bombshells, wow. Kinsey comes out, his first study in 1948, and this really was controversial. It was major because in surveying thousands of men in the first volume, they found that masturbation and oral sex, which were considered perversions, were common. Hello? Yeah. Suddenly, and it's very difficult, you know, to call something perversion if everybody's doing it, you know. Uh, all across America, couples were saying, oh, well, look, dear, we're not the only ones. The female volume came out in 1953, and this was also major because by that time they had refined it enough that they understood sex as not male, female. They understood it as not homosexual, heterosexual, but it was on a, on a spectrum. And even that was, is nowadays looks as pretty um, uh, limited. But at that time, it was revolutionary. It was revolutionary. Just a comment here. Some of these works have not stood the test of time. Uh, Kinsey's work uh, has been criticized for its methodology. You know, methodologies have, have been improved. Um, Frieden's book, if you read The Feminine Mistake today, it'll at times sound sexist, racist, homophobic. Um, no one is arguing that Uncle Tom's Cabin is a great piece of literature. Yeah. What they had in common is that at that moment in time, each of them had a huge impact on society, resulting in change. Books do not always change the world for the better. They can stoke hatred, prejudice, fear, bigotry. Noble books can be perverted for ignoble purposes. If you read the Communist Manifesto today, you'll probably find yourself agreeing with a lot of what Marx and Engels were talking about. Engels was the son of a rich industrialist, and he was appalled at the conditions of the working uh, people. And he, Marx, others were arguing for um, better working conditions from their, from their manifesto. We had more of the social revolutions during the 1800s, um, but we also had the labor movement coming forth. This manifesto was giving voice to humanity rising up, asking for greater equity, um, and that the workers should be benefiting from their production, from the benefit from the, their labor. This was commandeered by Vladimir Lenin and Mao Zedong and turned into the foundation for an ideology for, of totalitarian societies, brutal totalitarian societies. And so it's been impugned because of that. We also have books that, we, that act as red flags, warning us, you know? And so with those totalitarian states of, of um, the Soviet Union and later uh, communist China, George Orwell was writing uh, 1984, but he was really writing about 1948, 
you know, what was actually there. And he was projecting that these are concerns for the future. Be aware. This is how surveillance works. Watch out whenever you have something called the Ministry of Truth, uh, or today maybe Moms for Liberty. Just, you know, hey, there's something in those names. Watch that. Yeah. But Aldous Huxley, who wrote Brave New World earlier, his society, I think, is even more of a threat to us because he has this harmonious society where people are genetically um, created to fit in. Uh, and everybody takes Soma, which is this drug that makes them really content and, and, and pleased. You know, Aldous Huxley was once asked, which is the greater threat? Brave New World, its world, he presented or Orwell's 1984. And he said he thought Brave New World because it's easier to control people through pleasure than it is through fear. We've seen 1984. It's being realized in the Soviet Union, in communist China, East Germany, all of that. But I put to you, that are we aware that Brave New World may be what the Western democracies should be concerned about? And think of all the ways that we are numbed and find pleasure that um, doesn't permit us to be as aware as we should be. I'm thinking internet, television, you know, all of those things. World transformation begins on the personal level. That's the idea. Let's look at the personal level. Here I'd like to share with you some books, a few books that personally really impacted me along with Lord of the Flies and leading into hearing what books have, have really impacted you. First off, how books transform us. I think they transform us by new information, by new ideas, and by new perspectives. And you know, some of you will say, well, yeah, new information can be a new idea and new perspectives can give information, all that. I grant that, yes, yes. But let's look at these individually. For new information, like Earth revolves around the sun. I'm talking information that can be verified, not opinion, okay? Earth revolves around the sun. Humans evolved over millions of years. We are destroying our environment. Masturbation is more common than you think. All of that was information that had a profound impact on people's lives. Under new ideas, this is not necessarily verifiable information, but ideas, the divine right of kings, that kings were ruling out of God's um, will. This was very popular idea among kings. I'm not getting something here. Oh, there we are. Okay. All men are created equal. Again, today, that's sort of a given. We think that, although we know that all people are not created equal, but it's the concept, it's the idea that can still inspire. But at this time in the late 18th century, it was a phenomenal idea, revolutionary. Women should have the same rights as men. Again, something that we take for granted, even though we don't always practice it, but we accept it. That was an idea that had to be fought for for centuries. Workers should share in the benefits of their labor, an idea that fueled the labor um, movement here, Australia, England, and then in Europe. Nothing is more powerful than an idea whose time is come, said Victor Hugo. What's significant, what's key there is an idea whose time has come. All of these ideas have been floating around. None of these were original with those books, but there was something about the book, the time, the moment uh, made the idea come forth. And so we might question what, what ideas are finding their moment now in our own society. Under new perspectives, 
what like is like, what life is like as an enslaved person. We read the autobiography of Frederick Douglass. We get a sense of it. We get a sense of it, how the humiliation, the indignity, um, the injustice of it. What life is like to be poor and hopeless. John Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath, again, put a human face on the Okies of the depression coming out to California. You couldn't read that without feeling for uh, the, the Job family. What life is like to be a woman without rights. We read uh, reading Lolita in Tehran and get a sense of how constricted a woman's life can be. She not even has the right to her own children. Now, we get a sense of that. What life is like to be Prince Harry. Okay, you know. Some of the books that really impacted me. I was 13. 13 was an important age. Um, Black Like Me came on and um, was given to me. This is a story about a man, a uh, journalist. Griffin sort of overdid it on the tanning and went really dark. So he looked African-American, looked dark, and then he went down into the South. At 13, I was just becoming politically aware. The civil rights movement had been going on for some time, but I really wasn't keyed into it. This is the book that, that really hit me. Now we talk about gateway drugs, you know, a drug that's supposed to lead you on to the harder stuff. I think we also have gateway books, books that we can read. And then you read, you're led to read on beyond them to the harder stuff. And so this book got me reading uh, James Baldwin, The Fire Next Time and his novels, or Eldridge Cleaver's The Soul on Ice, or the novels of Toni Morrison. You know, it got me going into the harder stuff. Uh, it all those surpass this book, but this book was key. Similarly, um, years later, I was in college when I read um, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. Really, this book ruined me for John Ford Westerns. Never again could I see one of those Westerns, you know, in the same way. Uh, that's where I began to understand the broken treaties, the injustices, the brutality uh, on the native people. That's where the glorious vision of manifest destiny, I began to see as really brutal conquest. Yeah, it totally reframed it. New perspective, new perspective. Most recently, um, this has happened with uh, this book, Gender Queer, which the Longview Book of the Club, uh, book of book club of our times group chose about transgender um, people. And this is a, a memoir. Uh, I was very moved by it because I really don't understand, didn't understand at all um, what it's like to be a transgender person. This gives give me an idea. Along with that, I read um, Beyond Magenta, Transgender Teens Speak Out. And this is maybe a little better because it gives you six different teens rather than just one talking. It also um, talked about the fetal development and how a fetus, uh, by getting different hormones in the womb, uh, can develop a uh, male genitalia and a female brain. I had not understood this before. This was really uh, eye-opening, uh, mind-opening, heart-opening, which is what I think books in their best at their best can do for us. By the way, in case you aren't aware of it, the Kelso and Public Kelso Public and Longview Public Libraries have started this program, Book Club for Our Times. There's an evening group uh, on Longview on the first Mondays. And there's a daytime group at Kelso uh, at 11.30 on the second Wednesdays. I encourage you to, to join. Um, we're taking books that are speaking to our time. Some of the, some of the uh, controversial books, uh, just as some of the books that we've talked about have been controversial in their time, we're looking at those today in light of these issues. So you might consider those. Another book that really... Um, was eye-opening and I've since surpassed it. I was my first year in college, I read Siddhartha by Herman Hesse and began my love affair with Hesse's works. 
this was the first time I ever really thought about the non-religious spiritual quest. And it just really opened up a whole new world uh, for me. Um, Brothers Karamazov. Okay, this is one book I do recommend to everybody. Uh, I think everybody should read this. Uh, this was amazing uh, in understanding a nation's soul, Russia, but also in helping me as a beginning writer to uh, see what a, a writer could do. In it, you have these four brothers, actually three and one bastard, who's not really, but anyway, that's a little confusing. You have the four brothers. Ivan or Ivan is the intellect. He tries to find meaning in the world through the through the through reason. Um, Dimi or Dimitri uh, is the sensualist, hedonist. He finds it through um, drink and uh, sex and you know embracing his sensual being. Uh, Alexei or Ayosha. In, in Russian novels, every character has to have at least five different names. Alexei or Olosha is the uh, the spiritual one, the young monk. Uh, he's looking for meaning, uh, searching uh, by, through to God. Those are the three Karamazov brothers. But there's um, a fourth one who's a bastard brother. Um, and you find out, spoiler alert, because you probably won't read Karamazov. He's not really a, a Karamazov, it turns out after all, he's not really a bastard. Um, his name is Smerdyakov. I love that name, Smerdyakov. And he's a nihilist. He wants to destroy. He's so bitter. He's so angry. He just wants to destroy. What, what Dostoevsky was doing, he was capturing the soul of his country in these four characters, the intellect, the sensualist, the spiritualist, the nihilist. And even today, I mean, hardly a week goes by that we don't read about some young man grabbing an automatic weapon and shooting up a mall or a school or a synagogue. And the police are saying, we don't know what the motive was. I'm telling them, I want to tell them, read Brothers Karamazov, you know, Smerdyukov out of his anger and his despair and the feeling of the world was so unjust, he wanted just to destroy everything. Okay, this is a book that I recommend. This is one of those books that people come back to me and always say, really? I love this. I've read it about three times. Every time I read it, I get something new out of it. It's a story about a man and his young son going cross country um, uh, uh, and with some friends on a motorcycle. And it is um, sort of a mystery as the man's trying to find his past self. It's about the relationship between him, he and his son. Um, it's uh, also a series of philosophical reflections on life. And on these long motorcycle rides, his mind just goes and you as a reader are going with him, questioning value and meaning and purpose. And it, it's, I loved it. I loved it. I've not found anybody else who loves it. And then The Color of Purple. Wow. Another book that just blew me away. If you've seen the Spielberg movie, it was okay. This is a masterpiece. And if you haven't read the book, this is one book I really highly recommend. What Alice Walker did here, not only in giving us the perspective of a young, poor African-American woman, but how she does it. The voice of Celie opens up. Uh, addressing God, and she's talking as a little girl. She's unsophisticated. Um, she's immature. And as the story goes, Walker develops Seely's voice. You see Seely maturing along the way. It's just, it's a masterful piece. And I just was, this, this really was one of the great books uh, for me in my life. Okay, real quick, new information, new ideas, new perspectives, helps us identify with others, helps us develop empathy, feeling with is what empathy means, helps us expand and de deepen our own emotions, which in turn can produce new understandings, new ways of seeing the world, new attitudes, which can result in new behaviors. There is a flow through there. 
Um, okay, your turn. I'm gonna ask Courtney, if you would take that side of the room, I'll take this side of the room and um, we'll ask you, where are some books I've got up here? Carolyn. I'm eager to share with you. My book was Huckleberry Finn when I was seven. I shared a bed with my older sister and she read that story to me because she read to me at night. And then when I went to graduate school, I was in my 40s and I read that book and I said, wow, because what I learned in addition to what you were talking about is ways of reading that I hadn't understood before. There were so many different ways of reading a book as well as the change in the reader himself. Thank you, Carolyn. Great. Thanks. Courtney, do you have anybody? I was checking, I was checking the Zoom. Um, I will say one thing that that when you were mentioning how you never, you know, you read a book twice in your life and it seems different to you. When I was young and I read Anne of Green Gables and I was, it was this young girl and she was studying and she was going to make something of her life. And then when I read it as an adult and now I read it just about every year, um, it's, I, I'm a mother and I'm taking care of my children and I'm seeing that process and I see it through different characters' eyes in a lot of ways. Great. Thank you. Here. Hi, I liked the Farewell to Arms, which I read when I was like 12. And then I went back and read it later on and I couldn't believe how much was in it. But I had a big argument with my teacher when I was in high school, freshman, because I read The New Class by Mila Van Gilas. And she said I couldn't understand it, but I did. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. Anybody else? Yes. Um I've been coming to all of these. Well, I think I missed one, but, and it brought to mind the fact that um, how much I enjoyed, I talked about this before, uh, the boxcar children when I was really young. And because I, and I think, and I've never forgotten them. I've not gone back and read them again and I should, but um, it's just this whole idea that you could go out and do something. And, and it was just these children that lived in this boxcar in the woods. And that, that you could do that. And, and it just hit me and I thought, I could do that. You know, and it's just kind of, it stirs things in you that you didn't, that are there, but you don't recognize them until Gave something you ideas. is yeah. brought up. And then you think, oh my goodness. Yeah. So anyway, thank you for doing thank this. Thank you. Joe? This is an oldie, but a goodie. To kill a mockingbird. I come from this little tiny town in Indiana, very white, very Republican, very isolated. And I grew up somewhere in my gut knowing there's more to life than this. The Kill a Mockingbird really opened my eyes. Thank you. Thanks, you. Hi, um, I jotted down um, 17 titles while you were talking, but I won't mention them all. Um, an example, uh, in high school, I'd say Bill McKibben's The End of Nature made me interested in environmentalism. Um, Michener's The Covenant and Apartheid. Um, and then in college, um, Annie Dillard um, and Feminism and Mary Daly's Gynecology for Feminism, um, Ellie Wiesel's Town Beyond the Wall, Holocaust, uh, Camus, the short stories of Andre de Boos, um, and then after college, Stephen Jay Gould, um, Dennis Covington's Salvation on uh, Sand Mountain, um, Steinbeck, of course, Middlemarch, Richard Rhodes, The Making of the Atomic Bomb. Um, recently, White Fragility by Robin DiAngelo and Telephone by Percival Everett. They've all like enhanced my life. Wow. Okay. You've got a reading list there. Okay. Hi. Um, so a book that I read in high school was The Things They Carried by Tim O'Brien. And it was about him, um, this young man being drafted to war, which wasn't a book that I ever thought that I would enjoy, but it ended up being one of my favorites because it was about the war, but also about fear and love and shame and um, what the truth really is versus what it feels like. And 
if that difference really matters. Um, and I also just want to say that a lot of the books that I wrote down that like really affected who I was growing up and as a child, a lot of them were difficult books, but they were so important because they they were books that offered me comfort and belonging and solace where I hadn't found it in society. And so I think that books can also be really beneficial in that way to to provide us some company where we haven't found it in other people. Thank you. Hey, I was curious, what are your thoughts? Certain people today want to go back and rewrite books to fit their beliefs under today's standards rather than learn from history, you know, make new history. What are your thoughts on that? My thoughts are, yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> what, um, you know, some of us, probably all of us at times will read books to um, confirm our beliefs, our attitudes. Um, we also probably have experienced books that challenge us, that make us uncomfortable. Um, and that's one of the great things about a book club is that you may be reading books that you normally wouldn't. Um, I probably wouldn't have read Gender Queer, um, but because it was chosen by the group and then I just really opened my eyes. So uh, yeah, I, I think that there is a tendency for us to read um, what confirms what we already believe, uh, but we have the opportunities to be challenged and to challenge ourselves and uh, to be okay with a little discomfort. That's a hard act to follow. Uh, Joe, Joe mentioned uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. I was more blasé. Nancy Drew Mysteries taught me that a woman could drive, that a woman could be independent, that she'd have her own car. <laughs> That one did that, you know, and then the Murier came along with Frenchman's Creek and you found out you could have romance. I mean, I have really thought about this. My idea of romance came out of the Murier, came out of a farewell to arms, came out of, I mean, I read, I not only read every one of those books out of the Rainier Library, the Heming, Hemingways and the, but when they sold them off, I went down and bought them, and they still have my maiden name and Margaret Barton Ross's maiden name <laughs> on the cards. So just for fun. That's a great Thank point you. about the like the communal sense that we get out of reading and with book clubs and also, but like, hey, look, I see that these people have read this book before me, or I read this book 20 years ago, and now I'm rereading it again. That's fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Oh, one more there. Oh, Joe. <laughs> Let's make this our last one. On to Connie. <laughs> Nancy Drew created my love of reading, but not because of the book. Because if in my family, if we were reading, we didn't have to do chores. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you all. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, I'm not done yet. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've still got a minute or so. Um, okay, so quick review. How books transform us. They provide us new information. They seed and disseminate ideas. They expand our consciousness, our awareness. They create empathy within us. They help us imagine new possibilities, whether it's science fiction, what it's like to live on Mars, or, or how we can possibly escape an abusive marriage. You know, New ideas that can liberate and change people. If you uh, would like to learn more about the book clubs or WordFest, you can check my website or email me. Thank you for reflecting with me today on books. I really appreciate it. Thanks.